And so now we are, we've assembled a panel. Um, so uh, we have um, some amazing panelists here today. Um, and so uh, Rachel will be joining me to host the panel. Um, Rachel is an undergrad here at UW. Would you like to introduce yourself real quick? Yes, hello everyone. Yeah, I'm an undergrad at the Allen School and I've been helping organize the event today. And right now I'm working with a grad student on research in the security and privacy lab. Um, and we have a couple of questions for each of our panelists um, as we get started here. Just a quick um, type chats in the question. Um, we'll read or raise your hand and we'll call on you um, just so that we're all on the same page there. Would each of you mind introducing yourself and uh, sharing a little bit about what you do now and your journey into research? How did you get started? What were some of the first things you did as you were um, starting to approach research? Um, and maybe um, Magda, you could start us off. Sure. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for having me uh, at the panel uh, today. It's just so great to, to see everyone. Uh, and be here. My name is Magda Balazinska. I'm the director of the Allen School. I'm also a professor. I actually have been in the Allen School for 15 years. I was just thinking I started in January 2006. So it's, it's pretty crazy how time really flies. Um, in terms of my journey, uh, what I like to convey to people is that I never had a planned journey. Uh, I went into computer engineering as an undergraduate, having no idea what I wanted to do. And my friends basically told me, if you have no idea, then do this because it leaves a lot of doors open. So I did, and I really enjoyed it. Um, and then I went, uh, I applied to a PG program because it just felt like such a cool adventure to like apply to a different country and do this. Um, uh, I did my PhD in systems because the, the professor showed a demo with like sensors, which I thought was just so cool. Uh, and then he wasn't actually planning, he wasn't recruiting me, which I didn't realize. He was just being nice and giving a demo to everyone. Uh, and then I, you know, uh, but I wanted to work with him and he had no space. So I just stayed in his office and didn't leave until he gave up and he said he would work with me. Uh, but I was supposed to work, look for another advisor, which I never did and then he forgot. So that's how I, I did my PhD with him and it was great. Um, and then I applied for a faculty position because it just seems so exciting when people are graduating and applying for faculty positions, they would like talk about it and travel to places and interview, so why not? So that's what I did. And then when I got the offer, Seattle just seemed so amazing and it was so amazing, so I came here. So any, so sometimes just good things come out even if you just kind of do things because they seem exciting and fun and, and just work hard. So that's my journey in summary. Thank you. Jamie? Great. Uh, hi, I'm Jamie Morgenstern. I'm an assistant professor here in the Allen School. Uh, Right, so so I guess my way of introducing myself via like life path. Uh, so when I was in college, I, I started thinking I wanted to be a chemist. More specifically, I think I was interested in virology. Uh, and then I spent four months working in a lab and bench work sucks. So <laughs> uh, I realized that like uh, like wet labs is are, were not the place I was going to like contribute meaningfully to, to like the forwarding of science like that was not going I was going to burn out on that very quickly um and so I, I actually I spent some time thinking I wanted to be a math major um and then I ended up doing you know a combination of math and, and computer science um I, I started doing research uh with like the, with the professor who taught my first yes class. Um, and then my, my undergrad was not at a place that at the time was really as much on the map for, for like, yes, undergraduate research. So I spent, I went and spent a summer doing research at Carnegie Mellon. Um, and uh, then I went to Carnegie Mellon because, uh, well, so I, I graduated at a slightly different time than Magda, but in 2010, looking for, you know, undergraduates, even with computer science degrees, weren't largely looking at, you know, $180,000 a year offers for, for straight out of undergrad, like you you all, those, those of you who are undergrads will be looking at. Uh, in 2010, the economy was not looking good. And I, I was pretty sure I wanted to go to grad school anyway. So I went to grad school. Uh, and, you know, that was the best choice I ever ended up making, partially due to economic circumstances, I suppose. Uh, and you know, grad school was amazing. It's this time where you get to spend five years thinking about stuff you really like to think about. 
uh, being accountable to almost no one, getting to travel the world on someone else's dime. Uh, <laughs> and uh, yeah, and if you have a good time doing that, uh, at the end, you, you get the opportunity to like, you know, apply for postdocs and then eventually faculty jobs. Uh, I did my postdoc and then uh, I was at Georgia Tech for a couple of years before moving to, to the University of Washington. Uh, where I uh, am just so excited to be and to, to work on research uh, here with, with lots of awesome, awesome students and other faculty. Oh, I guess I work on, I work on machine learning, uh, broadly speaking, but I emphasize uh, sort of thinking about sort of the strategic aspects of, of machine learning as well as uh, issues having to do with fairness and equity. Thank you. Um, Franzi? Yeah, hi, I'm Francie Rosner. Um, thanks so much for organizing this panel. It's, it's always, it's fun to hear the other panelist stories for me too. Um, so I am an associate professor in the Allen School and I, my research focuses broadly on computer security and privacy. Um, and I kind of like um, Jamie and Magda have kind of a story that is like, I didn't really have a plan to end up here and somehow I did. Um, I um, didn't even intend to do CS as an undergrad. I um, had not taken any CS classes in high school. I actually had the opportunity, but I didn't because it conflicted with creative writing, which I really wanted to take and which I don't regret that choice actually. But um, in any case, I uh, went to UT Austin for my undergrad and I did a liberal arts honors program there. And I had listed CS as a second major with that. And then when I was admitted to the liberal arts honors program, I told them to drop the second major. And I'm literally here because the advising staff in the, the liberal arts program office said like, mm, why don't you take a few classes and see if you like it and then we can still drop it later and if they hadn't done that i literally wouldn't be here um and then it turned out i really liked programming and i, I um uh got into research also kind of by accident i ended up in the i was encouraged to apply to the um, cs honors program at ut which also if i hadn't been encouraged to apply wasn't even on my radar um, and as part of that you were supposed to do research and so i was kind of keeping an eye out for potential research to do and i took a the um basically the hardware software interface class and I really liked that and I really liked the professor who was teaching it so I ended up doing research with him for the last two years of my undergrad um, and that was also kind of a you know a time where I was like eh, do I do I really want to do computer architecture research like I said I didn't even know about this before this class is this my calling um, and I think this is a good example that's not the research I do today I now do security research and I think it was um, basically, I did that because it was an opportunity I had and because the mentor I had was really good. And so I think that that mentorship relationship was really important in then preparing me to go to grad school and interesting me in grad school, even though that wasn't the research area that I ended up in. So I'm really grateful for that. Um, and then I switched to security kind of based on my interest, based on a course I'd taken when I went to grad school. I did my PhD at UW actually, so I've also been here a long time. I want to say this is, I, I started my PhD in 2009. So it's like 12 years now, which is also very strange. Um, and at the time I knew I liked research. I knew I liked security and I kind of just like worked my way through and I really enjoyed doing research. I wasn't necessarily planning on a faculty career path. Um, and literally I, you know, I, I applied for faculty jobs um, and I was planning to apply for some other jobs as well. And I didn't really know if that's what I wanted, but then the process of interviewing was so fun and exciting kind of going around and um, meeting people and talking to students, talking to potential collaborators, going around the country, you know, people on the job market now, it's maybe a little bit uh, different experience, but it was, it was um, just so fun and exciting. And I could suddenly see myself having that job with all the things that, that, um, are part of it. So, um, yeah, so that's how I ended up here. And at each of those stages, you know, I didn't, there was no like plan. It was just like the next thing. Um, in the middle of summer, I actually didn't apply to grad school right away. I went to France to teach English for a year because I wasn't sure that I wanted to go to grad school at all. Um, so, you know, people always tell stories in retrospect that make sense, but really everybody's just making day to day decisions and somehow you end up somewhere eventually. Thank you. Amy? Hey everyone, my name is Amy Zhang. Um, I'm actually a new assistant professor at UW and new to UW and Seattle in general. So nice to meet you all. Um, yeah, I think I really resonate with the stories that other folks told. Um, I, I did know that I wanted to do computer science when I started college. I actually 
um, in high school, I had done like APCS, gone to like, um, I, I lived in Texas actually, so I went to like a, a UT Austin like girls summer camp for CS uh, in one year in high school. Um, and then I was also on my high school like competitive programming team. And um, there was, we had a, we had a group of um, three girls and we were an all girl <laughs> competitive programming team, which was like very exciting for me and uh, was why I wanted to do computer science in college. Um, but when I was in college, I just, I never thought that research was for me or that being a professor was anything that I could do. It just like wasn't even on my radar. I just thought that I would be a, like a software engineer like everyone else. Um, I was playing tennis at the time um, for um, the university and um, it, it was actually because of that. It was a really weird coincidence that um, I managed to find myself in a research lab uh, working with a really great mentor my senior year of college. Um, and it was because I had play, I was playing tennis for the team. There was some newspaper article about me and there was this professor who used to be a professional basketball player. <laughs> and he emailed me out of the blue to be like, hey, do you want to join my lab? We're both like athletes. And I was like, sure. <laughs> it's very like, yeah, random, right? Uh, anyway, I, I loved the experience. Like we're still great friends. Um, like he wrote like a faculty letter, letter from like a, a recommendation letter for me when I up, went up for faculty. So um, it's like a lifelong mentor of mine now. And I, I really credit him for like introducing me to research, to the research I do today and that I could even be a professor. Um, so doing research within my senior year. Um, and then another like fortuitous thing that happened was um, I got this fellowship to do a master's in the UK, which if I hadn't gone that, I probably would have, I had already, um, even before working with this professor had signed uh, because of a summer internship to be a software engineer. Um, so I canceled that software engineering job, did this master's in the UK. At that point, I was like, wow, I really love research. I've had two experiences now where I really enjoy it. Um, even then, I, I took off a year to go be a software engineer, um, confirmed to myself that it was not the greatest thing in the world to me, it's not as exciting. And so then I um, started my PhD. From there, I think kind of pretty early on, I was like, I want to be a professor, like uh, in my PhD program. I think probably is because my advisor seemed to have a really great life. <laughs> um, just the nature of the, the advisor I had at MIT, he, he like did yoga every day and like danced every night and like seemed to just have a fantastic time. I now know that there's a lot more stress involved and a lot of things you have to do as an assistant professor, but it just, it just seemed like the most like, like flexible and fun job that I could have. Um, so yeah, I just kind of like went through my PhD and wanted to be a professor and, um, and really enjoying my year so far. Then that's it for me. Thanks. Hannah? Uh, hello, everyone. Thanks for having me here. I'm Hannah Hajishirzi, an assistant professor here at Allen School. Uh, and my research are brought in um, natural language processing and also machine learning and artificial intelligence. Um, so I, I uh, both resonate with uh, everything that everybody said and also have kind of an I, I kind of had an agenda that I want to be a computer scientist in my life since I was 10 years old or maybe nine years old or something. <laughs> so so I, I remember I saw or I played with a computer for the first time in my mom's office at some point and I fell in love with the computer itself and I thought, okay, that's what I want to study <laughs> in future. And like back and forth, it changed a lot. But then uh, in high school, um, I was very much interested in math and especially the um, combinatorics math and like dealing with graphs and all those things. And I remember I asked the, some of the older uh, high schooler and also some people in the first year undergrad and they told me computer science is the closest area. And I thought, oh, okay, good. So because I also want to be in <laughs> computer science. So made sense. So I, uh, so, uh, we had an entrance exam in my country. So like I really tried hard to get into this computer science program, which we call it computer engineering in, in my country. Um, then uh, when I graduated, like, like many other people, uh, like we were, we were applying for graduate school. And again, that was kind of planned. Like basically every, many people who got good grades and everything, they apply for graduate school. And I applied to the US uh, 
but in in undergrad i was mostly working on theoretical computer science i knew i like it i hadn't done any research I just knew like for example i like programming i was involved in uh, acm competition like programming competition things like that but then when i was applying i knew i want to be a bit more applied but, so i got into ai but again ai more on the theoretical side not the kind of more like current machine learning applied area uh, and I did AI in my PhD, but toward the end, I wasn't sure if I want to go to industry or academia. Um, but at the same time, I thought it's too theoretical. I want to be a bit more applied. And in my postdoc, I moved to NLP. Uh, and I want to kind of give it a bit more time to understand what's going on in this area. And then I fell in love with it and started applying for academic job market. So um yeah so I, I had a pretty long postdoc which i kind of got myself like a, less than a phd but kind of got myself familiar with nlp at that period yeah yeah that's that's my path and now i'm really enjoying it great thank you so um we wanted to make sure we got in this question since one of the goals of the research day today was to connect researchers with each other and so i wanted to ask um how can undergrads get involved in research and also especially um in the time of not being in person if there's additional challenges that you might want to address yeah. and anyone can respond to this i know that franzi has been has been working on a more centralized methodology for for uh connecting up people who are looking to do research with people who have like great projects for introductions to research so maybe she can talk more about that i can say from my side i'm super super bad at email and so i get a lot of emails probably like 20 emails a day unsolicited from people i've never met asking if they can do research with me and i do not respond to most of them that doesn't mean i don't think you look awesome it means that i don't spend over an hour a day responding to just those emails. Uh, but Franzi, I think, is one person who can say a lot about it. Yeah, I wish I could say more than I can say. I would say it's a work in progress. Um, maybe it, there's maybe a few different things I'll say. Um, one is um, maybe to answer the question specifically, if you're interested in research in the security and privacy lab, um, we have a, a form, like a Google form, that you can fill out um, that will then, I think, prompt you to email me and Yoshi and David who co-direct the lab. Um, and I would say similar to Jamie, one thing that's challenging is that we have more demand than we have undergrad research available, like project availability. And the reason is basically because we also want to make, you know, we want to make sure that like, I'm sure we could come up with dumb things for people to do like, um, you know, and, and maybe you'll feel like the way Jamie did working in a wet lab. Um, but that's not what we want. We want undergrad research experiences that are, are really fulfilling and that uh, where people have ownership of something and they they work well with, um, you know, with a, a grad student mentor and so on. So we do put a lot of effort into making sure that there's a good match for a project and with a PhD student mentor and so on. And so um, the downside of that means that you know there's only so much of that that we can have capacity for at a time so like jamie i'll say like you know do not take it personally like you and in general you know maybe maybe the core piece of advice is like if you're interested just reach out to people and um don't be deterred if people don't reply or turn you down it's it's really like a lot more about capacity constraints than it is about a reflection on you and your value and your potential um that said you know i think a lot of us got our start in undergrad research. I certainly did. And so I really value undergrad research as an on ramp to that. And um, one thing I've been thinking about is how to try to make this process a little bit better. Um, it's, you know, I don't think we're going to solve all the problems. Like we can't, you know, create more. Um, well, maybe we can a little bit, but we can't create undergrad research experiences for maybe every undergraduate in the Allen School that would meet that criteria of being really fulfilling. Um, but we are trying to think about how to at least make it easier to find them, figure out how to reach out to different faculty and so on. We do actually have a, um, a centralized website now um, that I'll find the link in a minute and send the, in the chat that at least has ways for um, various faculty or labs who have provided information to that page to give different labs have different processes for how to get involved. Sometimes it's email them, sometimes it's fill out this form, sometimes it's do this challenge problem, but we're trying to at least collect that in a centralized place. Um, I think there's a lot more we could and should still do to make this a little bit 
um, more centralized and uh, less um, sort of less opaque, um, but we're not quite there yet. But that's that's kind of yeah, that's some initial thoughts at least. So I wanna I wanna add to what Frenzy said, and also I agree with Jamie that I, that I was also getting a like I am um, was also getting a lot of emails for undergrad research, and I definitely was not on top of the emails. Uh, and at some point, one of my amazing grad students helped me uh, curate some of these Google forms. And then when I get an email like this from an undergrad, I would forward them the link to Google form and then uh, they would start filling that application. And now this is shared with all the people, all the grad students in my lab. They are looking at the applications, interview the candidates and so on. But exactly as Francis said, like we don't have the capacity to get uh, kind of to interview everyone or also uh, work with everyone. Uh, but I think that's a good strategy if labs could make these Google forms because at least we have a kind of unified way of collecting all these applications. And also I have one suggestion, which is, uh, for example, if you are interested in working with um, me in my lab, you can take a look at the papers and see if some of the work seems interesting and start directly contacting the grad students who work on that project because, because that's basically how, how it works in my lab and I think in many other labs, which is uh, we kind of assign one grad student to mentor the undergrad. So I think directly reaching out to them also is very helpful. So I'd like to second uh, what actually both Anna and, and Franzi uh, and Jimmy are, are saying. Um, uh, I think on one hand, especially since I would say right before COVID, we really started to try to get much better organized in terms of uh, having a structured um, mechanism for undergraduate research and then COVID happened. So we paused on it, uh, but we plan to resume it when we're going to be back in person. So kind of stay tuned for, for that, uh, those opportunities. We definitely want to do better. In the meantime, since we are in the mode of being ad hoc. I actually think that what Hannah suggested is really, really a good idea. So what I would recommend is think about the classes you took. If there's a class you took that you thought was really exciting, then you can look at the whoever taught that, cl that class, but also other faculty who work in that uh, area. They're, they're all listed on their website. You can email the faculty directly, but then also check their graduate students, their projects, and then email the graduate students because graduate students have a lot more time. They might be happy that you're, you know, you're uh, excited. And then the more you can say, like, you know, kind of emphasize your qualities. If you happen to have a really strong grades, attach your transcript. If you uh, happen to be, you know, very creative, then maybe read parts of their paper and then say, you know, there's so many kind of cool things we could do. Even if you propose randomly, you know, random ideas that maybe you're not like a perfect fit, people reading it, they're like, oh, okay, this person's actually really enthusiastic. They're already putting in the time. So uh, uh, I would strongly recommend that. Yeah, I agree with all that. Um, I'm definitely like, I, I try to respond to all the undergrads that reach out to me, but um, you know, maybe missing a few here or there, but um, I'm definitely more likely to respond and actually like schedule a follow-up meeting if it looks like you're like actually interested in like the projects and like have done a little bit of research beforehand into like what our lab does. Um, another thing I'll say that could be a good avenue is um, just getting to know professors like through through classes and and um, outside of class as well. So, um, you know, some students that I've met um, who work with me now, like um, I met them like through teaching a class and um, they, um, you know, met with me in my office hour or talked to me after class a little bit. Um, and we kind of got to understand like each other's interests and I could uh, tell them like, oh, like what you're really interested in sounds like this thing that I'm doing in this project over here, like, you know, maybe we could explore this further. So um, that's another great way to just get to know your professors as well. And actually, I'd like to share one more thought that's complementary to this, is that in computer science, they're gonna, it's such a vast, uh, broad area, uh, but there are kind of, I would say, four categories of the kind of work people do, right? So in some cases, some research groups will do a lot of systems hacking, they will like build software, build systems, experiment with systems, so a lot of kind of software development. Some groups will be developing new hardware, sensors or computer architecture, etc. Some will be much more human focused, right? Doing all kinds of data visualization, you know, uh, human computer interaction, human robot interaction, etc. Um, and then some are going to be uh, more theoretical, so really like proving really complex algorithms, etc. What happens is 
kind of within you want to find which bucket makes you the happiest or which bucket you would like to have experience in you might want to try a couple of buckets as undergraduates just to see what you actually like because what you think you like might not be what you actually like uh, so it's good to try and then if you have one of those buckets you can really have a lot of flexibility in which group you're going to work with. So let's say you decide, I really want to do some systems work. You can talk to some of the machine learning faculty who do more systems oriented work, to the operating systems faculty, the networking faculty, the database faculty. All of them will be doing some kind of flavor of systems. Uh, and the same for the other bucket. So if you don't hear back or don't manage to get a position in kind of exactly the group you were hoping for, there might be other groups around that do kind of work in that similar kind of bucket that will also make you happy uh, as a researcher. Thank you. So I'm, I'm loving the, the themes, like the different ways people approach research. It seems like there's no one right path to end up doing research. Um, and then also the theme of like, reach out and it's it's not personal if you don't hear back there are so many opportunities but make sure you're doing your due diligence on your end first like read a paper make sure you know what you're talking about make sure that's something you're interested in thank you for sharing that um the next question is um about what are the some of the ways you've sought to balance the work-life challenges um like friends and family outside of work priorities and then and if there were any fears about uh taking leave or other other risks you've taken in your career and also encouraging the room to make sure they're asking questions i'm going to give the panelists a question a second to think about that while i encourage you to raise your hand if you have a question or put a question in the chat um we'd love to, to hear questions from the room as well so i think so um, the question about leave might have something to do with children, which is something that I, I at least can't speak to. But, uh, you know, the work life balance thing is something that everybody, everybody struggles with. Uh, and I think you basically have to decide sort of what your rhythm is going to be. <laughs> and it changes over over time, right? Like there are times where you will really want to work a lot and you won't care so much about some of the other stuff. And then there will be times where, you know, you want to work 25 hours a week and you want to spend, you know, 50 hours a week, I assume, or more with your small child or with your friends or, you know, on some hobby that you have and you really like. Um, and I think it's the, the most important part of this is basically establishing for yourself what you want and like telling yourself it's okay to do that amount of work when when it's appropriate. Um, you know, you probably can't be like a faculty member at like a top 20 department and only work 10 hours a week, like permanently, maybe for some period of time you can do that, but you probably can't like sustain that over the course of like an entire career. Um, so there's, you know, some lower bound, but like, you know, there are some people who probably maintain like a, a, a great career on, you know, standard full-time hours or even a little less. And then there are some people who work twice or three times that much. And, you know, you, I think one important thing is finding a balance and a rhythm that works for you and not comparing yourself to everyone else, because there will always be someone who's willing to put in more hours. That doesn't mean their work is better. And it certainly doesn't mean that they're happier. <laughs> So uh, I think it's important to figure out, you know, whether it's, you know, I, I let myself exercise for an hour every day and no one will take that time away from me, not even like my boss, <laughs> right? <laughs> not that Mongo would try, but like, I will not allow anyone to take that time away from me or feel bad about having that time set aside, right? And I think um, everybody has their own, uh, their own set of, of things and you just have to be willing to like, say that that is how you're working and that that's okay with you. Yeah, I want to emphasize the idea that um, balance is something over time and it's not something necessarily to achieve every single day. I think, you know, if you're working on things that you're excited about, um, you know, there probably and hopefully are times that you want to be really pushing hard on it um, and spending more time on it in a week than you would consider healthy to spend on it every week forever. Um, and um, but careers are really long, right? And there are times to push hard and there are times to, to you know, push less hard and push hard on other things. Um, and I think one, one thing that has helped me is kind of thinking about this, not as like every single day or even every single week, I must achieve this balance between like these impossible to balance things of like work and sleep and family and friends and exercise. And like, you can't all do all those things in one day or even one week. And I think it's okay to kind of view your, your life as having different, um, different seasons in a way. Um, and um, 
Yeah. Okay. So that's one thought. The other thought to maybe, maybe to answer specifically the question about leaves. Um, so I've had two kids in recent years, one uh, who is now three and one who is uh, four and a half months. So I've actually just come back from maternity leave um, for the second. And um, I'll share one thing that actually really surprised me, which was that um, I think both times, this time is maybe too too soon to tell, but definitely with my first leave, what I expected was that I would go and leave with my baby and then come back and everything would be super hard and uh, I would maybe not care enough about work or I'd, you know, certainly the, the balance is challenging. That's the, you know, it would be a lie to say that it's, it's not like without any other commitments, small children are very challenging. Um, but I think what really surprised me is how much like renewed energy I had for work actually after coming back from leave, kind of like putting everything aside, um, you know, for a few months and focusing on my baby and thinking only about like the most important things at work that I really wanted to think about. Um, and then coming back and kind of having renewed energy and focus. And I was really surprised by that. I did not think that that's what would happen when coming back from leave with like you know, a three month old at the time. Um, but in fact, it was like, well, if I'm going to be spending this time at work, which frankly is, is easier in some ways than spending time with like a small child, um, like what do I actually want to be doing with this time? And so rather than like doing, maybe I, I think I work cumulatively fewer hours, but I think I work more, I'm much more discerning about working strategically on things that I think are important to work on. Because if I'm spending this time working, I want it to be on something that actually matters. And so I actually found that I had like renewed energy and excitement for working on things. And that was, that was just a surprise to me. So I, I definitely agree with everything you two said. I don't have much to add. I can just give you some personal experience which is um, like maybe when I was undergrad, grad, grad student and so on, uh, really I was working harder around the time that it was closer to exams, deadlines, whatever, right? So, so you cannot say, okay, every day I work these many hours and I'm fine. Um, so like, for example, in grad school, there were, there were times that I was in the office up to 2 a.m., 3 a.m. and some days I was even skipping office. So, um, so I, I didn't have any regular kind of time slots working and maybe working from home or work, working at office. Uh, but then when I had my kid, uh, exactly as Francie said, I, my schedule became much more kind of uh, defined uh, and I, I'm much more organized now, which is I know after this hour, I, I, I prefer not to work. I wanna spend time with, me, with my daughter. Uh, and now I'm getting much more efficient on kind of how to manage my time uh, during the hours that I'm working. Um, and exactly as I, as Francis, I'm not working less, but I'm like kind of limiting the hours that I'm, to, I'm, I'm working. Um, and regarding leave, I, I didn't take a full uh, maternity leave. I don't know. I, I wasn't feeling like that. We had a nanny. Uh, I was kind of... Uh, I, I wasn't having my regular meetings and things like that, but I was kind of following what's going on, um, but definitely working much less. Uh, but exactly as Franzi said, like I, my leave was ending at the summer and many of my students were at internships. In that summer, I started reading a lot of papers. I remember uh, I, I felt like I'm kind of restarting research and I, and I renew, like exactly as Franzi said, I, it, it was like I have a renewed energy. Um, and, and yeah, I, I wasn't behind, honestly. Yeah. yeah, I feel like people's answer to this question is going to depend a lot on if you're like pre-kids or post-kids. Like as someone who um, doesn't have children yet, and, and I do think my answers to this will change afterwards, um, but like at least, and, and also it's personality wise, like I know some people just really like having a nine to five kind of uh, set up. I, I realized pretty early on that that was not me. Like I I like the ability to kind of like take off in the middle of the day if I wanted to like take a nap or go out for a long lunch or something um, or work late at night. Like I'm also a night owl and I enjoy working in the evening sometimes. Um, so it, sometimes like when talking to people about it, like it, it sounds like I work all the time or, or that I am working a lot, but I, I don't really feel that way. Like I don't feel like stressed or that I feel like I need to work many hours it's more just that like I may not be working the same hours that other people are working and I like that about my schedule it's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to be a professor is that I can kind of choose my own hours and 
decide like when I'm on that that's the time I'm going to be working and then when I'm sort of like tired or want to do something else that I can do that too um so yeah I and I imagine that yeah when I have kids that that may totally change and then I'll have to figure out how to have a more like regimented schedule let me add a few things uh without uh, repeating so all great advice I think but I, I would like to just one thing that I would like to repeat is to do not compare yourself to others and do not believe what other people are saying uh, other people will always say that they're working 100% of the time, never sleeping, and they're just amazing, or that they never work and they just have accomplishments fall on them from the sky. So, like, it's just not true. Like, people say, people just like say random stuff. So, like, whatever people say, just ignore it because it's not true, and just know that it's not true. So that's one thing. Just know deep down for yourself. Um, the second thing that I think is extremely important is never ever make a decision about your future based on your worry if this is or isn't going to be a lot of work. Honestly, like the, the hardest thing to do uh, would be, and many people share this, for example, like if you fall sick and you have to take care of little children, like that's really hard. Working hard at work is just part of life. So I would say whenever you're planning on your next step in your career, don't let hard work discourage you because you might actually enjoy it more as opposed to a place. And as one concrete example, when I did my undergraduate, it was at Polytechnique de Montréal. You have never heard of it. Exactly, right? So party, I mean, people party, all kinds of people doing all kinds of things. And I wasn't that happy. I honestly just didn't socially belong there and it wasn't great. And then I went to MIT where people told me, don't go, you'll work all the time and it's going to be crazy. And it is true. I discovered that at MIT on Friday, you go get a beer, play pool, and then you come back to work, which kind of blew my mind. But then, you know, I was just so happy because people were nice and you're doing things together. And okay, maybe we were like, you know, in the lab doing something, but you would get coffee. So, so I would say just don't let the hard work ever discourage you because you might actually find that the place and the people and what you're doing ends up being actually more enjoyable. And the third thing is honestly, if you want to have an easy life later, you need to work hard now. So the harder you work when you're younger, you're taking the hard classes, doing the hard degrees, doing kind of great things, then the easier your life will be later. So I really highly recommend that. Thank you all for sharing. Um, we have a hand raised from Ayushi, so feel free to unmute yourself and ask your question. Hi, thank you so much for doing this session. It's been really helpful. Um, so I'm an incoming undergrad, so I just like had a few, like had a question about like something that I'd heard um, about like research in general. So I've heard that like, you know, um, that in order to get research, you know, you really need to know the professor. So you always have to like in your classes, you have to always like sit in the front and like always volunteer and like things like that. And so like as I'm making the decision process, I'm that's making me kind of lean towards like more smaller schools. So would you say that like at UW it's like kind of different or like how necessarily does that stereotype hold true that you, you know, you always have to just put yourself out there and that's the only way you can get research or things like that? I don't think that's true. So just to kind of keep the, the answer a little bit short, I think you can, uh, if you go to a place and you know, you sit in the back and the professor didn't hear about you, but you can still email them, email their grad students and try to reach out. So I think there's more than one way. Um, definitely as people advised, if you do show up to office hours and you do kind of you know, ask a question and people start to know you, then it got, does get easier because they get to know you. Uh, but I can also know you just the same thing at a larger school than I think a, um, a smaller school. And we do really cool research. Like if you look at the kind of research we do here in the Allen School, I think it's really awesome. So that's also good to consider. Thank you. Yeah, it, it's hard for me to say because I've not gone to a small university before or for my undergrad, grad, or now at UW. I've just had this experience of being in a really large university. But personally, I very much enjoy it because of like the wider variety of things that I get exposed to. Uh, both in terms of classes and like research that's out there and like opportunities for research. So that would be one plug for kind of like a larger university. Um, but I think, you know, it, it also depends on what you're looking for. And my undergrad was, I, so, so it's not, it's not an, I, I went to the University of Chicago, which is like, it's a small CS program compared to like top CS programs, like by those standards. But like, you know, I think there were five, maybe seven uh, people who graduated with a CS major in my undergraduate class. <laughs> so it's small in, in that regard. And also I think it had, I don't know, a thousand people per class for undergrad, right? Much, much smaller than UW. Um, but 
you know, and that that made it easier to get to know my professors, uh, who then put me in touch with professors at CMU, which made it possible to do research at a place that had someone who was like a better fit for my research interests. So like, I think both both ways work. It's true that you may be less likely to have someone in the department who does something, you know, in your department or school or whatever, if you go to a smaller place, um, but you maybe get to know those professors a little better who can refer you to someone at a bigger place, but at a bigger place, they're already there. So, you know, I think I think all the different ways work. Again, don't be afraid to ask questions, but um, we did ask um, respondents if they had questions before. Um, and so one question we have is, what is the coolest thing you did lately or are looking forward to in the next couple years? I'm excited to do math at a whiteboard with some of my students again. I know, I feel like our standards on this have maybe slightly changed. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm excited to go to a mall. I mean, like, what are we talking about? <laughs> I know, I was gonna say I'm in my office in the Gates Center for the first time. I think I like came by to pick some things up last summer, but this is my first time working in this office since March of last year. So uh, I'm pretty excited about that, except for the lack of coffee on campus. I have not yet met any of my students yet in person, so I'm super <laughs> excited for that. And also just officially moving to Seattle. I haven't actually moved yet, so just really excited. But if you're asking for more earnest things that aren't like, oh, COVID has screwed up your life for the last year <laughs> answers, uh, which I imagine you are, <laughs> maybe we can come up with some answers that are like slightly, hmm. Uh, but I think the getting back in person is, is, is great. Like I, I admit, we actually hired a bunch of faculty. Actually, Amy and I never met in person, for example, uh, which is really funny. Yeah, so meeting to people who we have been colleagues with for a while now in person and students would be just a totally awesome. And one cool thing that I, uh, I, I've been doing recently, so I'm actually really worried about like this year and just not being fun for, for my kids. So one thing we started doing uh, not long ago is we actually started doing a movie night where we alternate, we either order pizza or like get hamburgers. And then we watched these old movies from the 1980s. So movies that I watched, like, you know, the Back to the Future and those movies that I watched when I was 13, now that my daughter is 13 and the little one is 10. And it's actually really fun to kind of go back and rewatch those, uh, those movies. Yeah, for me, after you mentioned that I finally thought we at least did something cool. I mean, with, with not a high definition of cool. Uh, over the winter, uh, we, we, we decided to go skiing, like definitely making sure we go skiing every week. And we did, and we did it, we made it. Uh, and, and my daughter, who is four years old, learned how to ski. So it was really good. So. We have a lot of skiing people on this panel. I know Franzi and I have gotten skiing together. So. And I know Magda skis too. So I think we've all figured out like little ways to have fun in fairly safe ways. But I do think one thing that is like independent of COVID maybe is that like, so uh, now that I've been at UW for a little while, I'm feeling sort of, uh, I'm, I'm very excited to get back in person. I'm also feeling like sort of my creative and like excited work work things are like coming back in a way that like it always takes a while when you like start something new. There's like a lot of there's a lot of transition stuff. Uh, and I'm I'm just like very excited about pushing on a bunch of different research things uh, that I like it may be like when you first start somewhere and you're teaching and all this other stuff. Uh, that take that has a lot of cost, but like I'm starting to feel like you know even though there have been lots of transitions within the transition that that's finally going to be like uh, that yeah I'm feeling like that's exciting. Uh, so actually, I, I see some questions in the I see some questions in the chat, and there's one question that's totally related, Jamie, to what you're saying. And maybe since we have like seven minutes, we can have like one of us respond to these different questions. So that question was, what advice do you have? for transitioning into different roles throughout career? For example, going from undergrad to grad school or from grad school to faculty? And if someone wants to take that question. I can yeah. add one sentence. Uh, yeah. Having more responsibility. <laughs> like first you are just, uh, 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 you are just taking care of your courses, exams and things like that. Then in graduate school, your research agenda um, and then in faculty, taking care of research agenda of too many people. So. Yeah, and actually I will just add one thing for whatever stage of your career, never, ever, ever just wait for people to tell you what to do. Wherever you are, just 
do what you think you should be doing. And then if it's not the right thing to do, then people will advise you to kind of do better or do differently. But just wherever you are, and every time you kind of go into a new step, just do what you think you should be doing. This kind of reminds me of something that I like to call the myth of adulthood, which is that like somehow you think that the people who are in the career stage ahead of you have everything figured out until you reach that career stage and you're like, hmm, I don't have everything figured out and maybe they didn't either, so. One minor thing is it's maybe worth thinking of like, once you go to grad school, for example, treat it a little bit like a job. Like, I don't mean like, like stress about it and whatever, but I mean like, it is no longer a thing that like, oh, you can spend like, you know, however much time or however little time, like you should, you should have it, like this is part of your like professional development. And uh, I, I think that you all are probably not folks who this will be a problem for, but like there are definitely some people who struggle to recognize that like at some point grad school is more professional, maybe a little bit than undergrad. <laughs> um, so, you know, respond when your advisor emails you asking for something critical, that kind of stuff. <laughs> um, which I don't, again, think any of you will necessarily do, but like there are grad students who fail these basic like transition points, so. And I to add actually, that, remember if you are at grad school, it is your PhD, not your advisor's PhD. So th this is actually something I'm trying to teach my students really at the beginning. I think that's really important. I think the treat grad school like a job is also useful actually on the flip side of thinking about the the you know work life balance which is that uh it is a component of your life it's not your entire life and so um again different people have different working styles and this works differently for different people but um unlike amy i actually have always been someone who kind of like works really well with a like maybe not exactly nine to five but like a structured like this is work time and this is not work time and i found that to be useful both to preserve the non-work time but also to make the work time really effective and so i think yeah i think there's some value in viewing it as a job from multiple perspectives and i'm also seeing another question in the chat which is uh, what was your favorite or least favorite part of grad school so I loved grad school. <laughs> it was like one of the best times of my life, I feel like. Um, I, I really enjoyed it as a period where I felt like I had the freedom and the flexibility to explore projects that I was interested in and that I could direct my own time and direct where my energies were. So um, one like the things I loved doing during grad school were like, starting of new collaborations, having conversations in the hallways, like going to talks, um, meeting people outside the university and like starting something up with them. Like it felt it felt very like generative and creative and like it's like and a way for me to channel like my excitement into the things I wanted to do. Um, least favorite thing about grad school, I would say um, is I think more of the like stressful related aspects of it so like you know at the end of grad school like especially as I, as I was getting towards the end of grad school I had to start thinking about like oh I have to leave this wonderful environment that I have and these people that I love and I feel very comfortable in and like venture out into the world like um they they call the faculty job search the job market uh, because it is kind of like a job market like you, you it's like a, it's like a coming out party kind of like you, you go around to different universities and you like present your work and yourself to these these people who are like you know your your future colleagues potential future colleagues um, people in your research area um, and, and it does it it feels intense like it feels like this this very kind of pressure cooker moment and I, I spent a lot of time like thinking about how to present myself well. I agree. The job market was like a super, super, super stressful time. <laughs> um, and I didn't do it during grad school. I did it at, after a postdoc. Um, but, you know, yeah, I, I don't think everybody's stressed out by it. I think probably even people who say they aren't are. But like, I guess this goes back to Magda's thing. Like everybody is somewhat stressed about it. But like, uh, I don't know. I, I was trying to resolve a two body problem. And so like, I felt as though both my professional self, who I was as a person, and then also my personal life was like being evaluated by all of my ever and future colleagues. And that was very, very stressful for me. Um, that, that did not feel great. And I won't name a school, but one school like basically told me I was making a mistake by not letting them uh, decide in you know June, whether or not they were going to hire me. They hadn't interviewed my partner uh, and and that I was making a huge career mistake 
uh, by not waiting for them to make a decision. Uh, and they were sort of blaming it on my personal life, which I really hated. I also want to add one thing, because uh, as Amy said, graduate school, most of it is very mm, happy and fun and everything. But there are like, at least it was for me, there, there were periods of time that my research wasn't going well. And I was even thinking of quitting the PhD at some point. So I think this happens to a, to a lot of people. Um, but, but, but be patient a bit, so it, it will come out. And I think that's actually really important. So before I started my PhD, an older friend told me, when you do a PhD, you will want to quit once a year, and that's perfectly normal. And I think it's just good to keep that in mind, because, you know, you, you write a paper, even if it's a great paper, it might get rejected. It might get rejected twice. So that's like the second time you submitted it, and it still got rejected. It does happen. And yeah, as Anna says, you have to be patient. Uh, and you just have to know that this is normal, like things just like it's not the case. And again, just never believe what people say. It's like nothing ever goes right. Everything always goes wrong. And somehow in the pile and mountain of things going wrong, somehow kind of good things come out. So just be patient and know that it's it's perfectly normal. Well, we're coming up on two o'clock now, and I just wanted to say thank you so much. to all Can we give them a round of applause really quickly? Um, and uh, we're excited to have you. Um, and, and thank you for sharing all your wisdom and, and advice for us.